Hi, fashion dolls. It is Fierce Female Friday, October 21st, and welcome to an all-new episode of Style by Stevie. Our next special guest today, fashion dolls, is a pioneer in the fashion industry, and he has styled some of the world's most beautiful, gorgeous women, from Cindy Crawford to my favorite, Cara Young, to Janet Jackson, to Drew Barrymore, to Christy Brinkley, Laura Hutton, Holly Berry, and so many others. I'm super excited for my next special guest today. He is such a pioneer and has worked with some of the world's most beautiful women in the fashion industry and has went on to design his own clothing collection and so much more. Without further ado, let's watch, let's welcome, excuse me, fashion icon, the one, the only, the man himself, Wayne Scott Lucas. Make sure you guys please share this live and let everyone know that we are going live to talk all things fashion and his some of his most iconic looks put together. So, ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Scott Lucas. Hey, girl. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good. What's happening? It is such a pleasure to have you here. It's such an honor to have you here. Why did you get me here, girl? No, <laughs> Thanks, Bobo. Bobo. <laughs> we love, I hope Bobo's watching. Does Bobo know we're on? Hi, Karen. Does Bobo know we're on? I'm fixing to share this live to him right now. Everyone, I need you guys so to shady. And let everyone know that we are on Fashion Dolls. I love it. Look at that hair, bitch. I should have put my hair out. You should be jealous. <laughs> should I pull mine out and flash it around? Hey, my friend Karen's there. Her daughter just got really great honorable mentions at school. And look at Richard Skipper's there. Everybody's there, girl. What's going on here? Hi, hair, hair by David. Hey. They are here to see you, my love. So before we kick off this interview, because you are such an icon in the fashion industry itself, you've worked with some of the world's most beautiful women. So let's Again. go down the list. Cindy Crawford, Janet Jackson, Christy Brinkley, Laura Hutton, uh, Drew Barrymore, uh, Glenn Close, Meryl Streep. The list goes on and on. All those shady bitches. <laughs> Every single one of them is shady bitch. Everyone. Oh, and Bobo is here. Hey, my hey, love. Bobo. I am Bobo. Yes. We love, if it's not for Bobo, he's changed our lives. I'm telling you. He's everything. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to follow him and hire him to do their Instagrams. Hello. And their marketing. Yes. Hello. And he's gave me some tips and pointers as well also. If it wasn't for that interview that I did with Carl Young, who you've also worked with. My um, best friend. Yes, yes. And Whitney Houston and so many others. You work with so many women. So you were born in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Tell us all about that. And where How ghetto. How ghetto, right? So ghetto. <laughs> I'm actually here right now. I came. To, this is my mom's house. I'm in my office at my mom's house. I came this afternoon. I grew up in New Jersey. I was a kid from Jersey. We didn't have any really money growing up. And we just kind of, my dad was a construction worker. My brothers were all into sports. And so was I. We had to be straight and play sports and be born again and went to church. And, you know, Jesus was the answer for our family. So that really was my childhood. And I did well. I was a great baseball player. I played amazing in soccer, but baseball was my sport. And my brothers were. My brother was the top goal scorer in the nation in uh, soccer. My other brother was getting scouted for the Yankees at a young age um, in baseball. So this was like a military baseball, real man's family. And I was choosing where to go to college, and my um, parents didn't want me to go to FIT because there was too many gay people there, and Jesus wouldn't like that. So. I had to choose somewhere else, so we chose. I went to Pratt Institute for Graphic Design, and that kind of launched me into what I could do now in my life. You know, because it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy here. The gay thing was not acceptable, and it was not an option. So, and gay meant fashion, and gay meant art, and gay meant all those things to my parents. So I had to really fight quietly, and at a young age, I had to fight to get here. And my um, the most important thing is, you know, I always say, you know, I came to the city when gay was so new and fresh and AIDS had just hit New York City. I came to the city in like 1980 and people started dying in 81. And I'll never forget, 
I had this moral structure based on God. No drinking, no drugs, no sex before marriage. Imagine that. So I thought I, I just thought that I had to be in love to have sex, so I didn't. And I thought that I had to keep these promises. And the reason why I'm alive, I would say today, and I avoided, I came here when AIDS just hit. And I was so ready to come out and party and dance and go to clubs. I used to go go dance at all Susan Barsh's clubs in little underwear. And I did all these things, but I never slept around and I never did anything. And I really, I do have to credit my moral structure, my, my born again moral structure, which is so bad now when you see it in politics. But for me, I think it saved my life. Because I know I would have been bad because if I saw Style by Stevie on the street, I would have had those pants down and that wig snatched. Uh, I'm lucky to be a blessing. <laughs> a blessing and a messing. Hello around. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So where did this passion for fashion and styling come from? Look at one of, one of Janet's biggest fans just, just joined. Mm, the original doll. Hello. Where, when did it, the passion start? Well, I was drawing and sketching all through high school and college. I, had, I was in the art department. I was in the music department. The biggest fight was the music department wanted me to... I played trombone, French horn, piano. I sang an all-state choir, competition choir, and in church choir. So the music department wanted me to stay in music, and the art department wanted me to go to college for art. So I wanted to go for fashion, and my parents said no because of the gay people. So I ended up going to Pratt Institute for graphic design. And it wasn't what I wanted, but like now during the pandemic, I designed album covers, book covers, novels. I had a clothing line. So God really placed me that all the graphics that I did ended up being exactly what I needed for my future. So I can say that I really got a well-rounded career. But we, I came from a real working class family. My dad is a, is a baby of 18. And his parents came right off the boat from the Ukraine. So for me, you worked. You did your job, you did your work, and you, you know, maybe you got paid, maybe you didn't. But my work ethic has always been extraordinary. And I credit that to the people that have been in my life, really, because I, I don't think I would have had this work ethic if I didn't have such a great family that um, made that so important. But I had a passion for art and I had a passion for music. So the sad thing is I don't sing anymore, but I'm surrounded by singers. And I, you know, to be on the set with Vanessa Williams and she was pregnant and I was sewing her into a Dolce Gabbana dress over her stomach. I was assisting Patty Wilson back then. And she sang Save the Best to Last for me, you know, acapella in the studio. And I remember those. And my times with Whitney when you'd say something and just like Jennifer Hudson, Whitney would sing you back the answer and you would just be floored. And there were times on video sets with Whitney when we'd be between shots and she would just then sing and you'd just be like, I was with her with Patty during Where Do Broken Hearts Go when that first came out and she would just oh. sing on the set and you would, she wouldn't just do the track, she would sing along. And I've been lucky to hear these voices and to be part of these really iconic videos and film where you just can't believe, you know, that you're in the presence of some of these people. And some of them are actually really nice. All celebrities don't suck. And you know what? Talent is talent. When someone has talent, it, it gets, gives you chills. It moves you, you know? So I've been lucky. It's been a lucky life. And it, you know, I, I spend a lot of time behind the camera and I had my own TV show and I'm happier behind the camera than I am in front. So I do these things, but I'm fine dressing people and taking care of them. And, you know, now I'm producing stuff and trying to make people look their best and I'm working on books and stuff. And I'm thinking I'm going to always be a support system to people. I'm looking for my glasses. I'm going to always be a support system to people behind the scene. I'm not always going to have to be the one in front of everybody because it kind of, I don't know. I like who I am when I support people doing their best work, you know? I talk too much. I'm talking too much today, girl. No, 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 no. And the audience loves it. Um, Fire by Nate is a fashion designer. He says, I can relate to you in your story. I'm going through this as well, too. And let me scroll through and read. Let me tell you something. These, these, this born again stuff in my, you know, I, grew, I was born in 65. I'm 57. When AIDS started, it was like 1979, 80. And we were all just coming out. We were 17, 18 years old. And I just thought, stay in the closet. You know, don't die. You know, find your way, which was probably the worst thing that I could do. But you want to know something? I'm still here. So I, you know, 
I was able to find my way in a world that I didn't think wanted me. And I found my way with parents that I didn't think loved me as I was. And I'm still here. You know, I had a partner that committed suicide in 2020. God, I forget now, 2010. And his father was a Baptist preacher and he went through the same things. But you know what? He didn't survive. He killed himself. And some of the notes were about how his father was horrible. And, you know, did God love him? And would he ever be a real man with a family? And I'm thinking, God, even 10 years ago, we still were speaking like that, like we were valueless. You know, that's why when you're with all these elections coming up and they want to take away your rights and they want to take away gay marriage, they're taking a, they're taking away your soul. It's, it's not about taking away goofy things and rights. It's taking away who you really are. And I don't think that people that aren't fighting for us understand that. So, I mean, God bless all this business and God bless being fabulous, but this is a constant, it's a constant struggle to show up and be real. And it's a constant struggle to love everybody that's out there. And I just, I went through a really, a really uh, rough call just now with a client and they were trying to point the blame at everybody else for why something wasn't successful. And I just said to myself, I have emails, I have texts, I know who I am, and I know how I succeeded. Because if I start to make it personal, and I start to fight, it gets me nowhere. I just, I've learned, I had a big mouth, I got a big ego, I thought, you know, I was charging 10,000 a day, I was turning down three and four jobs a day, and I thought that nobody mattered. And what I started to find out was, I really thought that I didn't matter. So when I figured out that I had some self esteem and some self respect, I started approaching these things differently. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Countdown. Sandra's birthday says, I'm watching you. I love Sandra's birthday. That's I think that's Cara. Cara, is that you or Sandra? That could be Cara. That's Cara's page. She put that up for her assistant Sandra's birthday, or that could be Sandra watching too. I just got off the phone with Cara. She loves you. She said, Bobo introduced you. She loves you. And I, I just think that it, it, Cara's my friend for almost 35 years. And when my boyfriend killed, c committed suicide, the only person, my friend Mary Roma helped get me some work. And then Cara actually dragged me out of the house and made me come back into the land of the living. It's her. <laughs> Cara, you shady bitch. I thought you were busy. Oh my goodness, Cara! It's such an honor to have you here as well, too. I'm so she's, she, she's no honor. Don't even try it. Oh, God. There's no honor in her. Me and her, we just got back from Las Vegas. Me and Cara had a big job in Las Vegas. We were selling Tina Turner's dress as an NFT at the OutlawNFT.com. Outlaw, OutlawNFTAuction.com. We were working with this lady named Christy, and Carl was the model, and I put her in Tina Turner's dress, and as usual, it came back to life. There's not models like Cara anymore. And, and speaking of iconic pieces, your pieces were in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. How does that feel? Girl, you saw, girl, you saw my piece? Not that. Oh. <laughs> girl, I can show you. Let me see. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> I, I did, um, well, this is a really, this is a sad story for people out there in the business. I did Janet Jackson's What's It Gonna Be outfit with Buster Rhymes, where she's in, she's the year 2000 Catwoman. I did Janet, I did Tina Turner's tour dress um, with C.D. Green, and I did Tina Turner's tour dress with Georgia Armani. Tina Turner's Armani tour dress became one of the most iconic dresses in rock and roll history. And the sad part of the story is, I was in Copenhagen, and I couldn't find something for Tina to wear opening night in Paris. And I was freaking out, and I said I wanted her to wear Versace. She's just like, I'm not wearing Versace. He makes you look fat. I go, why do you think Versace makes you look fat? She goes, have you seen Elton John? <laughs> So I said, Tina, that's not fair. So she wouldn't wear it. So I went to Africa, Paris, Italy, and Milan. Italy's in Milan, but in Milan and New York, I emptied all the showrooms. We had a fitting in Africa that was 
four suites put together in like 150 racks to put the whole tour together and we're working like dogs and she flies me on the concord then she flies me back then it's another concord flight she needed more and more and more and more and at the end i was sitting there and for the cover of l magazine if i'm talking too much stop me for the cover of l magazine Jill Van simone who cara knows very well because she used to see his penis on the set Shh. Hello. Um, you could see it through his pants all the time. It was a little shady. On the cover of Elle magazine, they wanted to put Tina Turner. So um, this fashion editor called me and said, we want her to wear Versace. And I said, she's not wearing Versace. But they said, no, no, we, they're a big advertiser. We want her to wear Versace. So they sent me that Versace Swarovski crystal rhinestone and black lace skirt that you saw Kim Kardashian tried to copy recently. It's so exhausting. And they sent it to me in a black shirt. So I put it on her on the cover and it was gorgeous. And I'm sitting in Copenhagen and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, if I could just take that skirt, if I could get them to make me a bustier, this could be opening night in Paris. So I told Tina and she said, no, absolutely not. I'm not wearing it. I said, okay. So I didn't care. I went backstage in the big, this big concrete studio in Copenhagen at the big stadium. She was going to perform that night. And I got, this is before FedEx. I mean, before fact, before cell phones, it was fax machines and FedEx kids. So I got on the handheld landline and I go, Hey guys, I said, I got to talk to you, Paul Beckett Versace. And New York City got me in touch. Veronica got me in touch. I called Milan and the phone answered and it was Paul Beck and Donatella. I mean, I'm a kid from New Jersey. I was like, what the fuck? So I said, I need something for Tina Turner. I just used a dress in the Missing You video by the designer Carmen Mark Valvo. I said, Tina loved how it swung and she loved how it fit. I said, I'm going to draw you the dress. I'm going to give you her specific measurements. Like Tina knows she wants it to her second knuckle and she knows to put it here because she knows where it has to hit her legs. She's a professional. So I sent them sketches via fax. I still have the sketches of take that bustier you made me and take that skirt you made me. You're going to put them together. You're going to follow my sketches and make a swing dress. They go, we can't make a swing dress out of Swarovski crystal and metal. I go, make me a swing dress out of crystal and mesh. And I guarantee you, Tina will wear it opening night in Paris and Bercy Stadium. She wasn't going to wear it in Bercy Stadium. So Paul Beck and Donatella were so kind. They said yes. And Gianni Versace was in the background and he was screaming out Italian words. And they said yes. And I said, the problem is I need it in five days in Paris. And they were like, five days, we'll make it happen. We, lo we love the Tina Turner. I go, okay, great. So I went back and I told the publicist and they got all excited and they said, oh my God. But I said, Tina hates Versace, so she's not going to wear it. But they said, don't worry, we're going to get press and we're going to make this happen. Well, five days later, they came to the hotel. Am I talking too much? Five days later, they came to the hotel and it was like, the lady from Diana Ross's Mahogany, you know, that wore the scarf and she was, she's like, darling, yeah. darling, I come and she burst into the room with the scarf flailing and the cigarette and she's like, where is Tina? To I go, you're not going to see Tina today. You're going to see me today. So in came five little Russian, not Russian, five little Italian, I call them Italian known as little grandmas in their black morning outfits. And they came in like they were on skateboards. They kind of, whoo, like you see in those horror movies. And they spun around like Wonder Woman and they put on these white coats and all of a sudden they were Versace's couture tailors. And then a man came in being fabulous with a big box, like a Fabergé egg. It was wrapped with ribbons and the ribbons were flying. And he's like, where is Miss Turner? I go, he ain't going to see her. Proud Mary's in the bedroom sleeping. So Tina didn't want to come up until I saw the outfit. Well, they opened the box and it was like um, Star Wars. Laser beams, uh, the, the Swarovski crystals were shooting out of the, in Paris, in the Paris light in the afternoon. The, 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 the crystals were shooting light everywhere. I'm like, oh my God, I got chills. I'm like, this is the dress. I know this is the dress. So I, I called Tina on another line and I said, uh, I, called her, I, I called her Mel, which is her wardrobe person. I said, Mel, it's Wayne. And it was Tina. She goes, yeah. I go, I think you're going to like it. She goes, I'm not going to like it, but I'll meet you in my room. So I met her in the, I went the back way. I met her in the private room and I opened, I had to take, the box was so big. I, it was like a five foot box and it was all stuffed. And I opened it. I had to take it and throw it on her bed. And it sunk into the duvet, this giant white box with gold Versace on it. And she screamed, Versace, I told you I'm not going to wear it. I'm like, please just look at the dress. So I untied the ribbon. I pulled the thing and I lifted the top and the tissue paper in the box was like, it was like 
it was lighter than butterfly wings. Like you felt like the, t I've never seen anything like it again. Like you never, you see it like it was going to, it was going to rip. So I start to unfold and unfold and unfold. And I take the, t I don't, I think I have it here. You want, you want to see it? Yeah. Wait, I think I have it here. It is somewhere. Wait, wait, I know it's here. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a sec. Ah, aha. I have the original. <laughs> this is the original, and this is actually Gianni Versace before he was murdered. That was the very last time he used that label. It's the Versace Couture label. I can't believe this is laying here. And this is what Cara wore last week. Here's the Boussier. It's one of a kind. No one has this. And the best part about this is that this is the actual one. Are you ready? Versace was murdered not soon after this. And Versace never, ever again made an outfit for a celebrity himself. And if you look inside, he hand-stitched all the bra. It's all hand-stitched by Gianni Versace. So I pulled it out of the box, and Tina went like, Wayne. And like the, it was unbelievable. She goes, she goes, give me that. And she grabs the dress and she opens this big bathroom door and she goes into the bathroom and the floors are tile and she turns the lights on at this hotel. I don't know if it was the Ritz or where we were, but the whole bathroom was mirrors. And she puts it on and she drops her clothes. And I'm looking at Tina with those fucking, fucking panther like black cocoa legs and this little tiny black, you know, dance belt she had on no shirt these big silicone she had like the first breast implants when they were like rocks and i'm looking at tina turner going i'm a freaking kid from new jersey and i've got tina turner naked in front of me with this amazing body she goes give me that dress so she pulls the dress on and she shimmies it up her body and the lights are flashing and i put one strap on and i put the other strap on and i zip it and at this point with tina you have to know i just stepped back because you see her in that dress all over. The dress took on a life of its own. It absolutely, you couldn't believe it. And it wasn't even fit yet. So I step back and I'm looking and she goes, step back, step back. And she's trying to be really tough, but she knew. And she get, the lights are on. She goes, where are my shoes? And I go, oh, Versace sent these. I don't want the Versace's. Where are the Louboutins that you made for me? I made her 175 pair of Louboutins before Louboutin was Louboutin. Those are the ones with the strap in the front, the black suede, yeah. you see? I custom made 175 of those. Ugo wow. and Louboutin closed the factory down because they weren't anybody here back then. We did this before there were anybody. And we actually sent them to LA and had the shoes. They put metal in the last of the shoes so that when Tina dances, the shoes don't ever break. So it's a big process. So I grabbed her the Louboutin shoes. She put on these six millimeter, these spiky, spiky heels. And in that bathroom in Paris, in the middle of the afternoon with me and her alone, all the lights were off except for the bathroom light and the mirror. She started to hum. <laughs> Better than, mm -hmm. she started to sing better than anyone. So there's Tina singing Simply the Best, humming it and going, <coughs> making all these sounds. And as she's doing it, she's doing the whole opening number for me in the dress in her bathroom. Iconic. And and watching, watching like she had to make sure that those, that dress worked and watching the moves. And, and I'm just like, I'm a gay kid from New Jersey. I'm like this. Oh my fuck. I, 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 I couldn't even take it. And she goes, okay, okay, okay. I like this. Okay. This is, oh, oh yeah. And the dress was, everything was, it couldn't have been a more iconic, like you said, perfect moment. And when we finished, she goes, okay, let's get to work. And she goes, where are the, where's the tailors? She goes, take it in here, lift the breast here. Five, bump it up. I go, Tina, wait, wait, I've got to get the people. So I ran to the other room and I said, she goes, okay, they can see me. You know, you can bring them in. And she goes, I'll come out. And that's when I knew she loved the dress because I came out, I said, Tina's coming. And they said, oh, and they all flirted and they all got quiet. I said, I went like this, just come just be calm and the door swung open it actually swung and it hit like it was like a movie it went blank and there was tina in that doorway in this standing there in the one-piece dress with the with the rhinestone shining and the versace badge and she's standing in the doorway and she just puts her hands on her hips and she goes i like it 
She walked over to them. She climbed on a coffee table. And those ladies started to spin around her, four ladies, with pins and pins and wires and buttons. And, and they fit that dress on her so fast. And she goes, great. We need, it in, we need it in Paris in two days. See you later. And she walked out of the room. And everybody was like foaming at the mouth. It, 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 you couldn't, and because she's kind, and she's full of love, and she's full of light. And when she shows you, I'm in shorts, but she said, when she says, take it in here, she's swinging her body. So you can see how the dress moves. So the people yeah. know how it has to work. So that was a master at work. And that's where I really learned about fit. So the whole, the, the, so you want to hear more? Yes. So, and the audience is loving it too. So, so that iconic dress was amazing. And it was opening night and everybody was ready. And then Versace's people called the day before and said, since we're making of the dress, it's 75000 for the dress. And I went, I go, okay. And they said, but we'll give it to you for free. And I said, okay, I'll tell Tina. So I called Tina and I said, Tina, they want to give you the dress. She said, Wayne. This is the first thing I'm going to teach you about this business. I go, what? She goes, nothing is for free. If they say they're going to give it to you for free, they're going to want something back for it. If they say it's a gift, they're going to want something for the gift. Nothing is free. I'm paying for the dress. I'm thinking $75,000. I go, okay. I said, I'll tell them. So they went back and I said, Tina wants to pay for the dress. And they said, how about this? Can we come backstage and can Tina shoot? with Donatella and Gianni, a picture, and then that'll pay for the price of the dress. We'll have her picture. And I said, let me go back. So I called the publicist. They said, absolutely. I called Tina. She goes, no. And I said, listen, the publicist said, because she goes, what if I don't like it? I said, well, if you don't like it, we still got the dress for free. She goes, Wayne, Lucas, you're not learning this. I said, okay. I said, let's just tell them yes. And if not, we'll pay for the dress. So opening night in Paris, I'm waiting and I'm waiting and it's 12 o'clock. One o'clock, two o'clock, no dress. No dress, no second option. They're all calling me. The press is there. The photographer's there. Uh, Gianni and Donatella are coming um, to Milan or Paris, but no one's there. No dress. I started to scream. This is the old me. I took my, I don't have anything here. I took the phone and I called and I said, where the fuck is the dress? And I'm banging the phone on the table at the Ritz in Paris, banging it till it almost broke. We have three hours. Where's the dress? Like going crazy. The opening night for Tina is like you put on tuxedos. Everybody in the crew dresses up. It's like dress up night. So I'm screaming. I'm, I, I can't believe that I failed. I am a fucking failure. I've done all this work. I've worked so hard. I've gotten all the way to here with Tina Turner. I was probably 1993. How many years is that? I was probably 30 years old. I don't know, but I did all this stuff and I failed. And we're waiting and waiting and we're calling and calling her manager, Roger Davies, who does pink and share called and said, Hey Wayne, where's the fucking dress? And I said, Roger, it's coming. He goes, where's the fucking dress? And he hung up the phone on me and I'm going, this is going to be my biggest disaster of my life. And I'm waiting and waiting. And it's now the, the show starts at seven. It's about five forty-five, almost six. And there's a, there's a call from the front desk. My assistant Hampton at the time said, the dress is here. I just grabbed my bags. I grabbed Hampton and we ran. We ran, you know, in Europe, it's those staircases. You can't wait for those elevators. So we ran all the way down these big marble staircases. We get to the bottom and I hit the ground and I slide across the marble floor. And in is casually walking Tina Turner's crew with another big fucking box. Who wants to unwrap a box? I've got to have a dress on stage in 45 minutes or it's not going to work. So I'm screaming. I go, give me the box. I grab the box and I'm speaking in a town like Vita. I'm saying all the right words I know and I run and the doorman opens the door and I swear to God he opened the door and they opened the car door and me and my assistant dove we just dove head first into the car and I slid my body across the front he ran around the front I had the box they slammed the doors we take off and we look up and Tina Turner's management sent a 50 a 20 person police escort. We had 10 motorcycles on each side of the car, like dignitaries. And we spread through the, we sped through the streets of Paris. And I was thinking of the song rolling down the river because we're riding along the river, the Seine, the river Seine. And I'm thinking, and we're rolling, rolling. And we are speeding so fast. We get to the stadium and the stadium is all covered in grass. So when you get there, 
I don't know how to get in. So we pull up and the car goes like this and they push a button and the wall opens. The wall opens and we go speeding down a ramp. We hit a speed bump. We fly. We get in. We get into the stadium and it screeches to a stop. And I run open the doors. Now it's 10 minutes to seven. She goes on at seven. And I run and I'm sweating. And the sweat is rolling down the crack of my back like it's rolling down the river. We get to her dressing room and I go to knock. And her assistant Mel walks up and goes, this is her wardrobe person. She goes, and her wardrobe person, Mel, didn't really love me. She didn't want me to succeed, but I love Mel. Hi, Mel, if you're out there. But this lady, Bonnie, and her, they really weren't, I don't know. It's weird, but I get there all excited, and Mel goes, I'm sorry, Wayne. She went, it's too late. It's much too late. Like, you can't have noise when you're on Tina's dress room. You have to be very zen. I said, what do you mean it's too late? She goes, it's too late. She's wearing something else that I got her. Oh, bish, no. Oh, bish, you didn't say that. No, bish, that's not happening. So she goes, no. She goes, I'm sorry, you can't go in. And I said, I, 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 Belle, I have to see her. So I knock on the door. She goes, hello. I'm sweating. I'm scared. I'm nervous. Wet as can be. And I run in and Tina's like this. Oh, hello, Wayne. What do you got there? As if nothing was happening. So I said, oh, nothing. I said, I have the dress from Versace. And I, and I said, I'll help you get it on. And, I, and she goes, oh, no, no, no. That's not necessary. She goes, just lay it over there on the table. She goes, we got a show to do. I'll see you out there. And I looked and on the rack, swinging on the rack behind her was the second version of a dress she wanted to wear. This ugly, tired, piece of shit, garbage, adult Jacob Banner. Rack going back and forth. And I went like this. I said, well, the dress. She goes, I heard you, Wayne we got to put on a show. And she was doing her lipstick and her gold fingernails. And I walked out and I thought that I had died. And me and my assistant, he said, is she wearing it? She went, I said, it's not going to happen. And now remember, the publicist was waiting. The manager was waiting. We had photographers and cameramen. And it's the first time Tina has worn Versace. And I had abjectly failed. And I went to the stage and, you know, if you, if you work with the celebrity, you sit in the booth in the middle of the whole theater. So I went into the, and I'm walking into the light booth and it's open air and it's 67,000 fans. And Mitch, her publicist goes, is she in the dress? Versace's here. I go, yeah, yeah. I said, it's all good. You're going to really love it. And Roger goes, Wayne, the dress came. I go, yep, the dress is here. And I looked at my assistant and I'm like, we're fucking fired. We are going home from Paris tomorrow. There is no way... Because if she just didn't wear the dress, it's one thing. But because she didn't wear the dress and the press was there and I didn't cancel the press, I'm screwed. So everybody out there who thinks they want to be a stylist because they can put clothes together, that's not the game, kids. It's the business of this business. It is kissing ass. It is knowing how to work your angles and figure out how to make this work for everybody. So I'm freaking out. We're there, the, we're there and they're all talking to us. And I'm, I, I think I'm going to die and I just want to go home. And... We're sitting there and it goes black. And all of a sudden you start to hear the band play and the audience is going crazy and I'm I'm watching and they're they're just going wild and you hear Tina going boom chakalaka -laka, boom chakalaka -laka, dun 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 and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and then I hear like the the the, the notes of simply the best. And I don't know what to do and I'm looking and I'm looking at the stage and right at the front of the stage, I see her hair. She's coming up from the ground. She's like here, and I see hair coming up. And I see more coming up. And all of a sudden, I look, and on her right shoulder is this. This, yes. I see the rhinestone strap coming up out of the stage. And I'm going, oh my God, oh my God. And somehow, I don't know if it was God, it was God. A laser hit that strap and it shot through this biggest stadium you've ever seen. And I'm like, I thought I was going to die. And then the other strap and then the tits and then the body and then that dress string. And Tina is on stage in the dress looking like the most unbelievable disco ball. Because if you see this dress live, it does something that you can't imagine. And she is shining all through the stadium and she starts to sing Simply the Best. My knees go weak. I grab onto the railing and everybody is high-fiving me and they had no idea that I thought I was going to die 15 minutes ago. And 69,000 people in a French accent sang Simply the Best along with Tina Turner at that moment. And in that moment, I'm like, are they singing for me? Did I finally make it? Did this kid from New Jersey succeed at a level that I never thought I'd hit? But it was the most beautiful moment and it was great. So 
end of the story is this. Did you like that story? Yes. The end of the story is this. It's the sad part you said about the museum. So that was, that was featured at the Met Gala. It was called the Rock Style Exhibit. And the year before I went with Carolyn Bissett, who, was, you know, who died in the plane crash with John Kennedy, she was my friend. That was a Carl Lagerfeld tribute. And this year I didn't get an invitation to the show. And I didn't, it was okay. I don't always go. So I didn't get an invitation. And then after the show, I get a call and I get a letter. Thank you so much for your dresses that you provided for, you know, the Met Gala. And I'm thinking, what dresses did I provide to the Met Gala? I didn't provide anything. They hired another stylist, Derek Kahn, who ended up going to prison for stealing diamonds. And he was the production person that was getting the clothes. And apparently he got a dress from C.D. Green that I worked with for Tina Turner. He put his name on it. Stylist Derek Kahn. Then the Janet Jackson dress that I had from What's It Gonna Be, that was my name on it. And then the Versace dress said, dress by Gianni Versace, designed by Donatella Versace, picked up by C.D. Green. My name was off of the dress. So that's why I wasn't invited to the Met Gala. So I just, I heard this and I didn't know about it. And now after, this is a dress that I carried through the streets. This is a dress that I protected and loved. This is a dress that I custom made. This is a dress that I got for free that's now probably worth millions of dollars. This is a dress that meant so much to me. And you know what? I had to call the Met. I got tickets with my parents as a tourist. And I went to the Met as a tourist. Now remember, I have three iconic music outfits of history in the show designed by me. And I go in as a tourist with my construction worker dad and my mom, and I look, and I had called, and they changed the name, and I looked, and behind three inches of bulletproof glass was my dress that I couldn't touch anymore, that I couldn't see, but I just looked at it, and I thought, I did that. Like, I did that. And I looked down, and my father, who was in gay for many years, looked at me, and he said, Wayne, he said, look, there's your name, Wayne." And there was my name in the Metropolitan Museum of Art as the best dress in rock and roll history. And he looked at my name and he said, you did good, Wayne, really good. And tears in eyes. And I thought, that's, that's why it's worth it. That's why it's worth it. So as, as much as it seems like there's all accolades and there's magic, they didn't even invite me to the show. And someone else pulled a shady shade and tried to cut my name out of it. And to this day, to this day, Donatella is still saying that she designed the dress and that Tina wanted it to swing more and that it was worn opening night in Milan. Hello? How many drugs lately, sister? That's not what happened. So, you know, it's a, it's a, everybody listening out there that's in this business knows that this is a business of horror shows and deceit. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will say that I think I was able to heal in this business and I hope I'm a better person because I got to a point that my ego was out of control. I was making so much money and was uh, doing the best jobs in the industry with the best celebrities. And it was great, but I started to believe the hype. And I had to, after the suicide, I had to really reevaluate who I was as a person. And people that knew me in the past that would get to know me now would probably enjoy me a lot more. But I start looking back and I say, you know, my whole job was to take care of clients and I did it no matter what it took. So, you know, I'm proud of, of the levels of this and I'm proud of the magic, but it was not easy. I'm telling you, anybody who wants to get into this business, it is not easy. It is, uh, it is hard. Nobody wants to pay their bills. And especially now it's changed. And um, it's interesting, though. I mean, you can make some good friends. Cara's my friend for 35 years. I've got other friends in the business I've known since I started. A lot of the older photographers are dying now. I mean, I'm at an age where you're seeing your friends die off, and it's not AIDS. It's just old age. Like, what happened? But it's been a good run. Do I want to do it again? Do I want to? I got a call from J-Lo once and Mariah Carey once, and I thought to myself, I never, I never want to go on a tour again. You know, I did seven world tours, and it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a lot. 
So, I mean, I'm grateful and I'm thankful and I know it all comes from God for me and I don't do the, first I want to thank God, I just know that the the source for me is God and that source has worked through me to make some magic in this world and I hope that it's, it's I have iconic things out there and I have history making movies and I have iconic ads and they're, they're going to always be a piece of history. So maybe that's how it ends for me and maybe that's what it does or maybe I do more projects, I don't quite know. And your work has been featured in so many magazines and books. Like I'm looking at the Kevin O'Quan book, Making Faces. And I'm in so, many, so much stuff there. Is that the one with Drew Barrymore? Yeah, that was, Tor that was Tori Amos. That was a great shoot. That was, he loved her so much. And when she lost, oh, that was Janet. We did her as Demita Joe. We did her as, um, what's that girl's name? Come on, you know the name. Dorothy Dandridge, and that was shot by Farooz Zahadi. And those are the couple of jobs with Kevin before he passed away. That's Drew Barrymore. Can anybody believe that? I keep writing to Drew Barrymore and saying, let's go on the show and talk about Kevin. She never responds. Look how gorgeous we made her. And she's wearing Norma Kamali. Norma Kamali that year did this like 1940s collection. And Kevin wanted to make Drew look like a 1940s Gene Harlow kind of star. So I think we did a great job. I'm in like, I'm in all of Kevin's books, I think. Yes, and you also did her design of a decade. That was great. You know what that was? That was the day that I met Janet. That was the day we met, and she was in the cover outfit. It was an Isaac Mizrahi coat dress that was amazing. And she took it off right behind her head on, on, on I guess, on camera left. That's my styling kit from those days. Janet went into this private area, and she said, I can't stand up anymore. And she laid down in her bra and her slip and her sweater. And I, I, ran, I said, I got Patrick to Marshall. I said, Patrick, you're not going to believe this, because I didn't know Janet, and he didn't really know her well. He did the tit shot with the two hands on her breasts. But I grabbed yeah. him and I said, you've got to see that. And he came over and he saw her laying there and he shot that and that became that cover. I mean, Trudy Styler, Sting's wife, wanted to wear the dress she wore in the final cover. And Bizarre Magazine called me from their offices and they said, we hear you're shooting Isaac Mizrahi dress on Janet Jackson. Take it off her. I said, no. And they said, well, Trudy Styler's wearing it in Bizarre next month. I said, I could give a shit about Trudy Styler and what she's wearing. I said, she's not Sting. So I left it on Janet. It became an iconic dress. And I always tell Isaac, thank you for that dress. It was a golden bronze. It's black and white in the cover, but some of the pictures have come out. It's this amazing golden bronze dress. Gorgeous. Yeah. So the stories behind the stories are the best. And Janet tried to send me home that day because I made a joke about her family, her brother, actually. I thought I was being funny. And about a year later, she goes, Lucas, you know, I was sending you home that day. I said, I didn't like the joke. I didn't like it. I thought I was being really cool making this funny joke. And she said, I was sending you home. You should have gotten sent home. And then we ended up spending, what is this, 32 years together. Now friends. I don't dress her anymore, but we're friends and we talk about stuff. And, you know, I, I, her beautiful son and her, her life. And I just, my friend, you know, Cara flew me out to Vegas two years ago. Janet had the Vegas residency and me and Cara went to closing night, which was amazing. So that's why. Awesome. Outstanding performances, and another one of my favorites that you did was from the Velvet Rope era. Oh yeah, we were in London for that, and that is John Galliano for Christian Dior. He did this Asian collection, this Oriental collection, Chinazari, and those are Philip uh, Tracy hair combs. He had these hair combs he made that were Spanish, but they looked Asian to me. So I forget. I think I think we're no. This guy shot that that I didn't know, but Tim Buchanan did the makeup there, and I think Janet did her own hair. It could have been. Janet's a tune, but we were shooting really late at night, London, in this soundstage, and I put her in that Chinese outfit, and she did that hair, and I found those combs, and I stuck them in all of her hair, and this is like one of the most iconic shots, and she did this song together again for all of her friends that had passed away from AIDS. Renee, her, Renee, her, her husband's cousin or brother, Yudi, was a very close person to the team and he got very sick and died. I don't know if it was AIDS, but he died. And when he passed away, she goes, I just want to remember all the people that passed away. I think Kevin had died at that point or no, she played that for me and Kevin in Albert Watson's studio and Kevin cried, Kevin Aquan. We heard that before it came out. Those years with Janet, every song was great. Every video was great. Everything to do with her was great. And I was lucky enough. People don't even know that I did all those things. They were all mine. You even did all the um from the all for you era. Oh, girl, that, that's a shoot. Was that's Kara's ex husband shot that Kara Young, Sante Durazio shot that at Tony. I forget his last name. Someone out there will know it. Tony, the crazy designer, Tony Ducat. 
um, yeah. in, in, in LA and we were in his house and that is a Donna Karen tank top that was made with the crystals coming forward instead of flat. She ended up wearing that in the All For You video too. Janet Tatoon did the hair. Fran Cooper did the makeup. That was a great shoot. Hard day. Tony Ducat. Yeah, it was a hard day. We shot a lot. And that's the day that I put Janet in a mini skirt and I put her in thigh high boots because she never liked showing her legs. So that was good to get away with that. Bubble says she named you in her tribute. How does how did that feel to have her name you, know, you in her I'll tell you, after the suicide, I, I'm going to keep telling you the sad stuff too because it's not worth telling you only the good stuff. But um, after the suicide, uh, I got a call uh, about three years later and on my phone, on my private phone, and I hadn't talked to her in a while. It was Janet. And I cried. I said, Janet, you're the only person that I want to talk to. I miss you so much. And we talked and then we didn't, then we hung up. We said goodbye. And about a month later, her assistant Terry called and said, Janet wants you to be her special guest at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And I said, oh, wow, that'd be great. I'd love to come. But you know what? I had lost everything after the suicide. I didn't even have a suit. So I went from having Gianni, Giorgio Armani custom fitting me and tailoring me in my suits standing there and pinning me to having nothing so i said i don't have a suit i can't afford the gas to get in like people need to know what this business is like i the suicide devastated me and i said i don't know my mom said okay let's go to macy's so me and my mom went to macy's in new jersey to the mall and my mom bought me a suit off the rack for 40 dollars. this is a guy that wore couture armani i wore Armani men's. I wore million dollar suits and my mom bought me a forty forty five dollars and eight forty seven eighty nine was the price of the jacket and the pants I think were fifteen on the sixty percent off double sale. And I I put on the suit and I'm thinking I'm buying a suit off the rack at Armani after the highest of the highs. And then I had to call my driver from years ago and I said, I can't I can't afford you but I can pay you back someday. And he said, don't worry, Wayne, I got you. So my driver drove me to Brooklyn to the Barclays Center and all I had was enough money to buy gum because I needed to have good breath. I didn't know who I was going to be with. And they said, come in the VIP door. You'll be sitting down on the floor with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And I'm thinking, this is interesting. So I went in and they wouldn't let me in the VIP area. And they go, you go around the other side. So I had to walk with the regular, it's okay, with the regular people. And I walked and I had to stand in line for an hour. And I got in and because I was late, they sat me up on top with the people. <laughs> I'm going like, what happened here? Something, I don't even know why I'm here. So suddenly someone walks in to sit next to me and they grab me and it's Janet's best friend from high school elementary school she grabs me and then johnny gill comes in and he's sitting next to me so then i didn't feel like such a loser because i'm sitting with johnny gill and then janet satoon came her hairdresser and she sat next to me with her son talent so i'm like okay these are our seats like we're not on the floor this is the seat so we're watching the show and janelle monet comes out and i'm watching the show and i still don't know why i'm there um and i'm watching the videos and i'm thinking my whole life is up on that screen my whole life is on that screen every you know when you do these jobs you're so busy that you don't you don't know where you are i traveled with tina i don't even remember being on a mountain in africa that's how overwhelmed i was but i did it so i'm looking i thought god and that was enough for that night that all my career because janet called a couple months before and she goes lucas we've done so much together and I go, yeah. I said, what are you looking at? And she goes, oh, no, I'm just looking at some stuff. Boy, Lucas, we did some great things together. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, you forget. Then when I saw it on screen, I was so blown away. It's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's international and nationally televised. And I'm sitting there and Jana comes up to give a speech and she thanks her team and her management. And then she goes and, and you can check it out on YouTube. But she said, and I just want to say, Tara Posey, who was her makeup artist, Janet Satoon, Kevin Aquan, Wayne Scott Lucas. And I'm in the audience and I'm going like, she goes, when I didn't feel my, when I didn't have any, when I didn't feel beautiful about myself, you always made sure I felt beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm the only stylist out of her 57 year career that she called out and thanked. And I sat in the audience and I was absolutely blown away. 
because it was unexpected. And then I get these texts. Oh my fucking God, I'm here. Janet just talked about you. And I look and Mary Ellen Matthews, my friend, who's the big photographer for Saturday Night Live, she's like screaming, waving her hands up and down, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. So it was, we ran out to the lobby. She's like, can you believe she said your name? Like, it was, we were fangirling out because it was like a thank you that I never expected to get. But those seven words changed my life. Because after the suicide, I thought it was over. And after he died, I thought I could never come back and do this again. But being told that I was worth it and being told that I was valuable to somebody and I wasn't valuable for my taste. I was valuable because I made someone feel beautiful. That's the magic. So, yeah, that was that was great. Bobo's right. Thank you, Bobo. That's he's really he's very smart about what shifts things and what changes things and you know bobo gives a lot of credit to the people that you help because a lot of times celebrities don't give credit back you know and i can give bobo credit for you know defending whitney uh, britney he defended britney like crazy and supported yeah. janet bobo was the first guy that brought control back when janet got all that control press and her songs were back bobo was promoting it bobo was behind the scenes but nobody knows that this guy is the guy pulling the puppet strings but they'll know someday I just called them out, so now they know now. Yes. And this industry is like this. What advice would you give to people? Because I know you've explained to us the ups and downs. What advice would you give to someone who's hmm. just like lost faith in themselves? You know, I, I, say this, I say this all the time, and I'll say it again. I said, shut up, show up, and do good work. You, you, you just have to have a little bit of taste. But if you show up for someone and you do exquisite work, and you do you have a little bit of style but you take care of them you feed them you make sure that they take that they feel safe that the clothes fit well shut up show up and do good work when you start if you shut up and show up and do good work for your boss you will learn and all of a sudden that celebrity one day your boss isn't going to be available and they're going to ask for you and you don't be shady you ask your boss and then you take the job and then you do what you have to do but i would say that and i would also say anybody that has some taste and that has some style that pays attention can be a great stylist, but you must understand how to do accounting. You must understand how to do billing. You must understand how to have some people skills. And then you have to walk into this business with some self-esteem and self-respect because I didn't. I didn't feel valuable. So I got beat around a lot in the beginning. And Patty Wilson, my first boss, who's very famous now, very famous fashion editor, Italian Vogue, used to scream and call me a fucker and, you know, don't fucking touch my telephone and don't, you don't fucking deserve the money and let's go to dinner. And then we'd go and she'd have me pay for both of us. I mean, I love Patty, Patty. I love you. But, um, it's, it was, I didn't have enough self-respect not to do that, but, and I was kind of a jerk to some of my assistants also, I have to be honest, but I will say that my, my jerkiness was always based on protecting the client. And if kids were failing, I, I had no, there was no opportunity to fail because we had a lot of teaching time in between jobs. So you can't fail at the job. Joe Dellett, who may be watching this said, my dad works for FedEx. Don't worry. I'll have all these clothes sent for the Tina Turner Haynes commercial. I've got it covered. Well, it was uh, $4 million a day to rent the Bel Air and to rent the studio lot. And none of the clothes showed up. I ripped Joe to shreds. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can't be sorry. What does what Lizzo say? It's about damn time. You can't be yeah. sorry. You can't fuck up. You can't fail when it comes to million dollar budgets and celebrities depending on you. You cannot. I'm sure he never missed it again. You track that. When you send a FedEx, you track it from when it leaves your door until it arrives the next morning. And if it gets caught in Tennessee because of a hurricane, you better get on a plane to Tennessee so it's things like that i was i was tough in that way but every assistant except for one said i learned so much you are amazing blah 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 and then my one of my one of my ghostwriters i'm doing a memoir called one of my assistants and he thought that they were doing a slam article on me and she called hampton and she said we are doing a story about wayne and we want to get your insight about this tina turner dress and he said what did he say wayne scott lucas he didn't say ruin my life. Did he say he, 
he made my life a living hell or something like that. And it made me laugh because what he didn't say was when he left my company, I got him a job with Paul Wilmont Communications. My friend Stormy, Stormy Stokes ran it, who was friends with Carolyn Bassett, John Kennedy Jr.'s uh, wife. And she used to work at Calvin Klein. And then Hampton ended up years later now owning the company. I guess wow. that I guess he missed that part. <laughs> that little part of the story. But I loved him for eight years. I had a great time with him. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry to anybody that I failed, but I was, uh, I was a work in progress myself, you know. And my thing was, I'm, I was so uh, codependent because of growing up with alcoholism around me that I um, really, really figured out that I was codependent to my celebrities. Cindy Crawford once said, oh, you've got to always hire codependent people. They'll do anything to please you. And I'm like, wow, that's, it's a really amazing statement, but it's the truth. And, you know, look, Bobo just said control was back. Oh, I just lost it. What did he say? On number one after 45 years. And that was Bobo pushing. I always want to tell Janet it was Bobo pushing. I know it was Bobo pushing. I know it. So, you know, um, the process of this whole thing is, you know, learning, learning how you fail and how you succeed and how you love and how you hate and how you care enough about yourself to not let the drama be bigger than the moment. And to know, like, I remember we were doing All For You and it was that final scene on Sunset Boulevard where Janet does the breakdown and it was four in the morning and we had gone... They had asked us if we, we didn't have, the union wasn't part of it. So they said, would you guys mind working extra hours straight around the clock? My teeth look so yellow in this light. They're not yellow. She goes, would you mind working around the clock? And I said, um, I, I would happily uh, work around the clock. And now it was 4.30 in the morning and it was a dance break. And I went behind a wall and I started to cry. I was so exhausted. It was like the third day. Remember, I dressed all the dancers. There were four different scenes. That was 45 outfits times three times two nights times around the clock. And the girls' feet were bleeding because they never danced in bare feet. And then I made them dance in those motorcycle boots in that one segment um, in the subway. Their feet were bleeding. I was wrapping their toes with moleskin. No one knows all this. We had socks and... It was. It looks great, but it was a disaster behind the scenes for them. And Janet just recently said, she goes, I've never danced in bare feet. It hurt so much to dance over and over. But anyway, I stood behind the wall and I cried. And I really cried. And uh, I looked up and right in my eye line was fucking Janet fucking Jackson. She was in that half leather jacket. She was in that Valentino belt in those vintage Big E Levi's for $2,000 in that top I got off Sunset Boulevard at a strip store, stripper store. And I looked at her and when he said action, she was Janet Jackson. And you know what? The least I could be is Wayne Lucas in that moment. So I pulled my shit together. I splashed some, sprayed some water on my face and I got it together and I finished the job. But it's like, it's really hard. It's really, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy road. I'm not complaining about it, but anybody that wants to get into it, I think it's harder now, except that a lot of these celebrities dress really ghetto. So you can get away with murder because I really cared that they looked the very best they could look. And I would beat up the hair people and I'd beat up the makeup people and say, I don't really like that purple on her eye to you. And they'd get really mad at me, but we'd have to fix it. So that's why Kevin Aquan, Janet Satoon, and me, Janet calls the Holy Trinity because the three of us, nobody worked together better. Fran Cooper came in and she was great too. It was, it was a great, a great pairing of, of people, but that only happens. Celebrities know that that only happens in your career once in a while. You find the right mix and God put us together for a reason. And it was the best years of Janet's life and Tina and Christy Brinkley, who I dressed for God, 30 years. And, and so many others, Glenn Close, Meryl Streep, Holly Berry, the list goes on and on. I've done all of them. And you know what? I've loved every single one for different reasons. Um, I was the guy that told Holly that Eric Benet was having an affair. Ooh. <laughs> I saw him outside Shutters. I was at Shutters doing witness protection because of the Super Bowl. 
Yeah. I was living at Shutters, riding in cars with tinted windows back and forth to Janet's house, 21822 Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. I was driving back and forth from Shutters in Santa Monica to Janet's house. And um, I came home one night really late after a fitting. It was like three in the morning. And there was, you know, those big magnets of champagne. There was Eric Benet just like drunk with the big magnum falling down, walking out of the hotel with a girl. And Hallie was doing James Bond over in Europe. And I'm like this. Hi, Steve. Yeah. Guess who I just saw outside the hotel? Ooh, you never know who you're going to see, girl. And we got a question for you. Um, Fire by Nate wants to know, what about people like me with the clothing business, but not the connections to be seen in the right places? What advice would you give to me? What's his name? Fire by Nate. I don't know. Um, what would I give him without the connections? I had three clothing lines. And really, what you have to do is you, you really have to start doing small shoots on your own. Like, get a, get a simple model. Don't overstyle it. Don't, you have to design your clothes so that they work for everybody in the beginning. And that's how you're going to get people that are going to buy it that are going to pay money. If you make things that are so crazy over the top that only your friends or your, your mom's going to wear it, it's not the way to do it. So what you really want to do is... Get the pieces together. Get your business plan in place. How much do you need? How much do you want to spend? Where would you like to be? And like like Joel Osteen says, and like, you know, I always say this with God, start praying big prayers. Find your dream and pray already thanking God for giving you your dream. Thank God for the answer. Thank God for your dream and thank God for your success because you're only this far away from the universe giving you what you want, but you have to show up part way. Do good design, show up, pray, thankful for the dream that's going to be fulfilled and know that Call simple local magazines. We have something called 201 Magazine in New Jersey. Offer your clothes up for a fashion shoot for free. They're going to say, where do you sell them? Give them a website because nowadays you don't have to be in a store. Start looking at the little boutiques that will pick up three pieces where you can't afford to manufacture them all. You know, and start putting the pieces together like that. And you can always on it. What am I on Instagram? You can, you know what I am, Wayne Scott Lucas style. You can always message me and I can always help you with any advice you need. So follow me on Instagram and I'm happy to tell you how to do it because anybody out there, anybody with a dream, as Stevie's top has fallen down, showing us her nipple like Super Bowl. Anybody, <laughs> well, you're, showing, you're showing your Super Bowl nipple. Um, anybody out there, you can really fulfill any dream you want. Any dream is available, whether it's dancer, stripper, comedian, designer, stylist, actor, model. The world is open right now for anybody to be anything they want, any way they want. It's up to you to show up, shut up, and do good work. Put together a nice reel of your, of your jokes. Put together a nice video on Apple Video. It costs you nothing of your designs and start getting them out there. And we have Instagram and we have Facebook. And Facebook ads, if you can afford to do a $5 ad for a week, you can sell stuff the first week. You know, and message me. You can always message me, and I'll help you if I, I can. A Whitney question. Hair by David NYC wants to know, how was it working with the late, I hate saying the late, Whitney Houston? How does she have an input into her looks? Is this David who, who I work with Christy Brinkley with? I wonder. How was it working with Whitney Houston? Whitney was with um, Ellen, Ellen LeVar for a long time. Yes. And then, I don't know who did her hair at the end, but after Kevin Aquan, she was working with Roxana Floyd, who's passed away now. God rest her soul. Um, what was it like working with Whitney? Whitney, in the beginning, was thankful, grateful, um, spiritual, kind, religious. I knew she, had, she was in love with Robin Crawford. I knew they were girlfriends, but they had to cover that up for, for business. And uh, Whitney was an absolute pleasure. Toward the end... I did the Michael Jackson concert at Madison Square Garden with the Jackson Brothers, and we shot it two nights before 9-11 when the towers came down. So we shot it on the 9th, and we shot it on the 10th, and then September 11th, the World Trade Center fell. So all the celebrities were stuck in town. They couldn't get back to L.A. The problem was Whitney came on the 9th, and she was in this horrible outfit, and she was so skinny that they fired her. You can see the videos and the videos you see on YouTube, she's retouched. Her and Michael's face and Whitney's body are retouched. They were so skip Whitney was so skinny in person and she walked right up. She looked me right in the face after 20 years and walked past me like she didn't know who I was. So I got a call from Clive Davis and he said, 
The next Whitney is going to be Deborah Cox. He said, can you dress her tonight for opening night? We're firing Whitney. So I ran to Versace and they gave me a dress and I dressed Deborah Cox and she opened the second night. So we shot over two nights. So that was the last time that I, um, I saw Whitney alive. And on my shoot with Whitney, this cover of Premiere magazine, if you Google it, Whitney used it on the cover of Premiere magazine. And she is in a black dress by Galliano. And she came into the suit after me knowing her from the second album. I worked with Patty Wilson as her assistant. And Whitney used to talk to me about God and about this God like gay people. We had these deep discussions. It's going to be in my book. But she came into the shoot and they wouldn't let me see her naked. They wouldn't let me dress her. This is when she married Bobby. They wouldn't let me put my hands on her. And they said, she married now, Wayne. She married now. And I go, what is this? Jump the broom shit. I said, I'm a guy from New York. I've seen her naked since we started. I just got to get her dressed. And she married now. We're going to do this, Wayne. We got the... She brought her own clothes on a rack. And we used to call this lady Fat Diane. She was this big stylist. And that was her nickname. It wasn't a put down. And she came in with a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken and a rack of clothes, rolling it in. And she'd sit down eating the chicken. And if Whitney didn't like the clothes, she'd go to Fat Diane's rack. So on that shoot, Whitney wanted to wear this fur coat by, um, and fur wasn't banned yet, but she wanted to wear this fur coat by Fendi. It was about $175,000 coat. So I said to my assistant, give her the fur coat, put her in the diamonds. She was so mean the whole shoot. I'm like, she's going to be fine. So we put her in the coat and then her publicist ran out, Mara Buxbaum. Oh my God, you can't have her in fur. Oh my God, they're going to go crazy. I said, you think fur is the worst thing that Whitney's done this year? This is when she was with Bobby. I said, you think that's the biggest problem? I don't care, get her out of the fur. So I went over to Whitney and I said, hey, Whitney, we're walking. And I said, Mara doesn't want you to wear the fur. She thinks that it's going to be too much and maybe I'll get... Whitney snapped her neck. You could have heard it snap and she said... Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? She said, you don't tell me what to wear and what not to wear. And I went, you know, Whitney, whatever, wear the fur. And I walked away and I just did my job, stayed to the side and pinned and did my job. And I was happy when she went home. I hate to say that, but that was the shoot before the Michael Jackson thing. And that was the last time I saw her alive and she was dead. And, um, Whitney singing on the sets, Whitney singing to me when she came in in the morning, she would sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Or she'd sing something and she would lighten the room. And on the sets, she would sing. And David, you would, you would have loved the time with her and you would have loved who she was as a person, because the way you feel when you hear that tone come out of her voice is the way you felt being around her. And Robin Crawford, who loved her more than anybody in the world, will tell you that she lost, we lost the world. I say with Kevin Aquan, I say with Whitney Houston, my ex part, my partner that committed suicide, I tell you, I don't think many people are supposed to be here for a long time. I said in the Kevin Aquan documentary, a lot of people come into this world and sprinkle, sprinkle some beautiful fairy dust all over us, and they give us magic, and then they leave. And all we're left is the, the fairy dust and some sadness. So if you can turn that fairy dust into, into some light, and you can start sharing the things that those people taught you with other people, your life is going to change. So, I mean, I, 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 I find that you know, it, it's been a magic time. And, you know, I know that Tina's not going to last much longer. And her fans get mad at me and they scream at me. But it's just the fact. Kidney cancer, stomach cancer. I mean, instead of saying she's not sick, start going, sending her cards and saying, I love you. Tell her that you love her. Tell her that you're going to miss her. Tell her thank you. But people are trying to keep these celebrities alive to make it good for them. So selling this Tina Turner dress, I'm giving part of the proceeds to abused women and part of the proceeds to Every Mother Counts to help mothers who suffer in childbirth with Christy Trollington because Tina would like me to do that. So the money's not going to me. It's going to, you know, me and whatever else, because if not, I'm going to give it to a museum because it should be in a museum. So it's, it's been, it's been, it, there's a lot more to go. A psychic said, God, you're going to live to like 90. Just stop saying it's over. You're 57 years old. I'm, what's over is the mess. I don't like the mess of the business. I like the joy. I just said to a friend, why don't we shoot all the young singers? Let's help all the young people. Let's get them clothes for free. Let's, I've got a girl named Nina. Her name is Nina underscore Lee. I think it's Nina Understory. Nina Lee Official on Instagram. This girl's voice is like Amy Winehouse. She floors me. And I just helped her out. Her parents are great. 
And I helped her out and I got her, I introduced her to Claire Mercury, who's a big publicist for Billy Joel and other people. And it's nice to watch her grow. And it's nice. It's very hard, guys. It's very hard to, um, to break into this music business. I mean, this girl is trying hard and she's talented. So I like to help the young ones and I like to give them the style at the level that I give the people that I've dressed all these years. You know, I can do it on a budget and make it look just as good, you know? Says, I am about to marry Wayne. He is a real one. Shout outs to Jay Evans. Who said that? Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have hair like Stevie. Wait. <laughs> Sorry, bitch. Sorry, party's over. Okay. Yes, you both have some hair now. <laughs> if, 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 they wanna, honey, if you, if, if you want to marry me, I run my own Instagram. Write me a message. I'm looking. Oh, Carl wants to join the live. Okay. Come on in, girl. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Young and Wayne Scott Lucas. She's a supermodel with super breasts and a super heart. Where are you? I'm in Millbrook. I just got here. But you, didn't tell me you, were going, you didn't tell me you were going upstate. You guys are, this is a really epic interview. It is grand. It is just, it really was special, the things that you shared. And I just want to congratulate you on what you did because it was incredible. It was just incredible. I and love you for that. It's true. So I mean, I'm, I'm totally moved by so many things that you said. You know, I think maybe I take you for granted. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> but I'm glad you that you said granted. Stevie. She, isn't she fab? She always has a different hair color. She's like Linda Evangelista. She always Karen, has different hair <laughs> Uh, I'm telling her beautiful things, and she keeps showing me her nipple. I mean, what the fuck? Oh, has she? Is it nice? Well, she keeps pulling it down, and it's, it's <laughs> nice. It's a, it's a little swollen. I would call it a bitch tit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. I can't see it. But I'm sure it's heaven. I can't believe you're upstate. How did you dump us? <laughs> I so didn't. I just Stevie, you don't know. I you guys and congratulate you. We, we love you. Face the sun. We want to get sun on your face. Turn around. That's it, girl. You need your light. You see, Stevie, that's how you do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go watch. I love you. Bye. I love you, Carla. Bye-bye. She's a star. I love you. Bye. I love you, too. Don't even look at that $57 million house behind her. She didn't get that from slinging, slinging chicken. <laughs> Car was yes, yes. She was in Prince's music video for Kiss. She was in yes. Kiss. She was also in Axl Rose's music videos. She's been in so many things that people don't know. And if you Google her, the millions of covers we all saw growing up at my age, it was Cara. It was Cara. And that picture of Janet Jackson before was shot by Sante Durazio, and that was Cara's ex-husband. Hello. And Cara's son, anybody out there who has a clothing line or wants to be a celebrity or in music, even you, Stevie, Cara's son, Nick Durazio, D-apostrophe-O-R-A-Z-I-O, he's a huge photographer starting out. Huge, huge talent. Call him. Reach out on Instagram. Definitely. I like when you know what I'll do chocolate. If you want to bring me some chocolate, I'll do chocolate. I, I'm a <laughs> what do you call it? I don't I'm not I'm not I'm not choosy. I, I like it all. Welcome, V Brown actor singer. Welcome, welcome. I see you all are coming in. We are here Hi Sandra. Wayne Scott Lucas and Kari who just joined the live. So you guys are getting the best. Of they missed Kara. Do you know that Sandra, who just joined, is Kara's personal assistant for years since her kids were born? No, I didn't know. Welcome, Sandra. Sandra M. Johnson. It was just her birthday. Kara took us all out to a big dinner in New York City at Double's Restaurant. We had a blast. Uh, no, it was fabulous. I seen the picture. Hi, Amy. Amy is amazing, guys. Amy does these amazing celebrity portraits and memes. You would love her. They should follow Amy. So, CB, what else? Um, what are some of your favorite looks? Because you've had so many looks throughout the years. Of course, you showed us the Tina Turner, but what are some of your top five favorite iconic looks? Um, anything we did for Janet for 24 Play. Mm -hmm. uh, that was all vintage, vintage Valentino, vintage designer. It was gorgeous. Um, 
uh, let's see. A lot of my Christy Brings Me Red Carpets, like the Tony Awards. She's in this blue dress. Hey, Amy, we love you. You're such a talent. She's in this blue dress um, with, uh, by, who was it by? It's right on the tip of my tongue. I can't believe it. Diamonds, hair up, look like a modern day Barbie. Um, I did some great stuff for Renee Fleming, the opera diva at the Metropolitan Opera. They're some of my favorite pictures, but nobody sees them because they were in Vanity Fair. Dressing Janet as Lena Horne in Vanity Fair was great. Um, I love a lot of the video music award stuff, like when we dressed Janet as Marlon Brando on The Tonight Show with that hat. You know, the mic pack was so heavy that I couldn't keep her pants up. So if you watch her dancing in that, her pants are falling down the whole time on the Jay Leno show and no one seems to notice, but the weight was, it was pulling her pants down. She goes, Lucas, I couldn't keep my pants up, Lucas. No, she called me, oh, I don't like Tyra Banks. I'm not going to respond to that comment. <laughs> Forehead's too big, hello. Um, uh, attitude's mean. So I, um, I love those looks. I like yeah, those are my, and I love all the music video looks. I think that, I know that they're iconic. I know they're going to last forever. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're going to be something that, you know, I try to make things that the kids can copy. So if you like something on Janet, I'd like you to wear it yourself. So this is how you make it. This is how you do it. And it's kind of great. So, you know, on Tina Turner, I mean, I, I've done stuff that people have never even seen on Tina. And um, I did Tina on the top of uh, Tabletop Mountain in Africa, which is an amazing, amazing video. And um, I did her in a Valentino dress. The Valentino dress was couture, and it was made. It was made for Susan Sarandon for Dead Man Walking. That was her movie. She was nominated for. And I walked into the showroom and I said, but Sa "Sandra said I have to be kind. I don't want to be kind." I walked into the show and there was this dress and you've seen it. Tina wore it at the Legends Ball. She wore it in a video and she's won it a lot. It was velvet on the bottom and on top. It was like a satin. And uh, they said, that's for Susan Sarandon for the Academy Awards. And she said, you know, you can't have that. She hasn't come in yet. I go, she's not going to come in anymore. And I grabbed the dress and I walked out of the room and took it to Africa. Hello. So those are my favorite, those are my favorite, um, uh, kind of looks and you know i like everything i put them in i i love i love my women and i love them to look great and i love to dress them and i i love when they feel great and remember everything as a stylist and for you guys out there everything i put them in they have to dance they have to move it's not constricting but they have to be snatched and then they have to move and i think that's an art in itself don't you think Absolutely. And you kept these are moments that are captured in time. Yeah. Um, we are going to do the Supreme Models finale Tuesday. I'm going. On documentary. Yes. Are on you going to be there? Me or Cara? Cara's taking me Tuesday. Oh, that is going to be immaculate. I'm going to watch that shit and I'm going to snatch some wigs. You're going to see. They'll go, those girls are going to walk out bald. Especially that Pat Cleveland. I love her. Love her. And the Mugler, I watched her in the Mugler show back in the 80s. And yeah. she is so innovative. I love Pat. Listen, the, 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 I was there when the black girls couldn't get a cover. I was there when Naomi was getting covers. I was there, Beverly Johnson. I was there years ago. And you know what? It's amazing how these girls don't know how much it, it mattered then. And it doesn't matter as much now, but it was very difficult. So those girls deserve our applause for getting their cars biracial. That was never unheard of on the cover of a magazine back then. And these kids laugh it off like it's no big deal. It's a big deal. You know, the world has changed in front of your eyes, and these girls really were there first. You know, give, give them their props. Okay, Tyra, I'll give you your props. Give them their props. And, you know, you keep, you know, being grateful. Someone asked, did you work with Linda Evangelista? You know what's so funny? Cara is great friends with Linda. Do you know that in all these years, I never worked with Linda? I've worked with everybody. Cara's best friends with Christy Turlington and Linda. Love her. The two girls, I'm friends with Christy now. My cousin used to work for her as her personal assistant, my cousin Kathy. My cousin Kathy's husband runs La Rock Restaurant in Rockefeller Center. So go up there and party with that disco skating. That's over, but the tree's going up. And she used to work for Christy Turlington. And those are the two girls out of every girl in the business that I never worked with. 
but I'm friendly with, and I just support Linda. Me and Linda never, our paths never crossed with all these jobs and all these people. And Cara always says I dumped them. What I did was, once I had done all my supermodels and Revlon was done and Cindy Crawford was done, I just went on to Janet Jackson and Tina and it became all about music. And I went on world tours and I did all those jobs. So it was a, it was different, but it was fun. But I really stopped working with the, because I was Claudia Schiffer and I did everybody. You know, Helena Christensen, you know, driving through... um St. Bart's with Michael Hutchins from In Excess before he passed away with Helena Christensen, late night parties, like really fun stuff, you know. And Christy Brinkley now, the kids really need to Google her again because she has not stopped. She's has as as a mom is going to possibly be a grandma soon and she is just still looking great and i did her for 31 years you know i've had great relationships with great women for a long time and yes you've worked with some of the most beautiful women including cara as well too and yeah. jay evans shout out to jay evans we did a music panel yesterday for 90s make sure you guys head on over subscribe to his channel and k tooks we did a music panel yesterday and we talked all of our favorite R&B albums and so much more. So you guys go and check that out. He wants to know when is your book coming out? He said he is ready to read it. You know, I've had such a hard time. I, I sent the book out during the pandemic and Cara has a great friend that works at Simon & Schuster and we, have, we, know, we all know a lot of people. Do you know that I sent my book out during the pandemic and nobody was working in the offices? Do you know I didn't get picked up by anybody with all this gossip that I have? And it was really about the Super Bowl. And then Janet said, please don't talk about the Super Bowl anymore. I want to put that to rest. So I had to honor that. So I decided that I would um, talk about, you know, the struggles of New York. I'm in talks right now. You know, Cato, Kalen, who was friends with OJ when that whole thing went down? Yes. His friend that I just did a show with last week has written 60 books. So we're in talks, possibly talking to Dupree Miller, this big publishing company. I may self-publish because the stories do have to get out there. And I've told them on the radio so much and stuff that people said, why don't you just do a podcast and read the book on the podcast and tell the story? So I have to figure out what's next, but there's, I think within the year, something's going to be happening. And I know that I'll start doing the talk show circuit to talk about it because from from presidents to queens and queens and kings and celebrities, I've without having any ego about it, I've worked with everybody, and I've been treated good by them, and I've been treated bad by them, and I don't have except for Tyra. I'm kidding. I don't have to throw anybody under the bus. I just have to know what I want to be around for my future because I don't want to be around bad, you know. Aaron says you need to have a podcast. He so would listen. And any advice to new artists on what to do when you're no longer the it person that is from here by david and yc do you mean you mean like when you were somebody and you're not anybody anymore right like tyra kidding i'm kidding what you need to do <laughs> what you need to do is crawl under a rock no i'm kidding i i would say here's a perfect example. I turned down three and four jobs a day, $10,000 a job. I was booked every day, all day. After that suicide happened, life changed for me. I had to reinvent myself and reinvent who I wanted to be. I wasn't, you know, to recognize that you're not the star, that you dress the stars and that you take care of the stars. That's the first thing. The second thing is you can be a star in your own life, working hard on, like I said, self-esteem and self-respect, working and knowing the source of your power, God or, or the universe, working to know what makes you a better human. Because by being the star in your own life, you're actually shifting everybody else's. So when your star has gone out, that you get created by publicity because i say we love to create celebrities and put them on pedestals and then we aim guns at them and shoot them and we try to kill them it's like not literally but you know you make somebody famous and then it's easier to drag them down you know so for me i think supporting other people supporting people coming up and giving sharing what i learned without being a douchebag and saying okay here's how you can do this Here's a job. I, a couple of kids I've given jobs to that I couldn't do. And I don't, they don't have to say anything. They just go, wow, Wayne, thank you so much. Just do a good job. Just make me proud. Do good work. If you need me, call me. And I think what you do is when the star starts to shift, you start to give back more. Because by giving back, you stay relevant and you stay present. And that keeps the universe going in a circle. And, you know, and it's never really over. 
I can go work tomorrow on a big video. The calls come in, but it's like my brain can't almost take the young celebrities anymore. I, I couldn't imagine a Nicki Minaj what those days are like. I couldn't imagine it. I would do like, I would do Lizzo. I would love to get her in clothes. If anybody knows her, I'd love to get her in things that fit correctly because I love body, beautiful, body positive. I would love to do her. I'd love to do Tyra for Dancing with the Stars. My friend Eric dresses her, but I would love to kind of tweak her a little bit and let her know there's a better way to do this, you know? And that's no tea, no shade. It's just, there. you got to look better on TV. So without being a jerk, sharing what I know and with the proof of my of the pudding and seeing my old videos and stuff i can do this and uh how can i help you guys feel good about yourself look better and know that you're great and help young people like today i said instagram me write me i'll tell you who to call i'll tell you what to do i just got two kids into modeling agencies and a lot of the modeling agencies aren't taking young boys anymore because so many boys were screwed around with and i said to this one agent i said this kid is 16 and he's beautiful make sure his parents take care of him don't allow him to go to jobs alone don't not hire young boys anymore we've got target we've got bloomingdale's we've got neiman marcus we need models but we don't need models that get abused so like kara's thing she's doing with the supreme models and christy turlington with every mother counts look at christy christy could turn down fifty-seven thousand jobs a day but she's giving time and money to charity and taking her kids with her on these trips to help these mothers that can't afford childcare. i mean so david that's what you do when you're when the star you thought you created is on on the waning side you show up in a different way and you give back because i sometimes feel like when you've been given so much um the sharing of it my, my psychic maria papa petros once said she said take your money and spread it around stop being scared it's going to come back to you and you know what when you spread the money it comes back in a circle and again guys pray big prayers ask god not for uh a haystack ask god for the farm don't ask god for a bus bus money to get to work ask him for the lexus ask pray big prayers because god says he's given you promises you know and pray big prayers and ask for big things and you know what you will receive them and if you don't receive them in that way it'll come in another way but it always comes i promise always know where your source is and it doesn't matter you know what here's the truth for me and i never said this it doesn't matter if you're famous or not famous on this earth or rich or not rich rich makes it seem easier but you know what when i know what my source is and i fall back in love with myself it none of it matters what matters is this what matters is is us what matters is human it doesn't matter who wins or loses i was so nervous about the election but you want to know something it's us it's us who just asked about zaldi what was that question um let me see it was from raymond starchin what did he say he says what do you think of zaldi dressing root i zaldi made the boots for janet jackson's what's it gonna be video that um she did with buster rhymes matthew anderson from rupaul's drag race who did rue her makeup and her hair and zaldi were boyfriends back then hello and um zaldi doesn't want to connect with me i don't know why but i try to be friendly and i he doesn't want to connect i think that zaldi has always done rue great i think the last couple of seasons in the middle there wasn't so great for a minute and when matthew left i really didn't like Ma uh, rue's hair and makeup i thought it was really terrible no tino shade um matthew is a genius uh i remember matthew when he was straight in new york city and said he had girlfriends hello and then the next week he was dressed as a flamingo with zaldi dancing on a cube hello so i go way back i go back to rue when rue had hairy armpits down at the pyramid club in the east village and a bad bad sheep shaking go afro so i know rue all those years me and kara ran into rue on the street we were screaming we love him so much but zaldi i think is an amazing talent he did great things for going to stefani he had worked on her clothing line he's an amazing talent and an amazing stylist and he was an amazing designer when he had his own line so i give props up to zaldi because he came from nothing and he came from being a club kid to who he is now and he turned it into a business the whole key is to turn this into a business yes and i'm seeing so let me read some of the comments you only live once wow didn't know that zaldi did the boots and the video 
was iconic with Busta Rhymes. The boots Janet wore for IGL, who made them, and were they the same boots that she wore on Rosie? What's That's IGL? What What's IGL? What's IGL? Um, could someone type IGL in the comments? What does that mean? Uh, let me see who asked that question. I oh, get, I get lonely. so lonely. No, they weren't the same boots. I didn't do I get so lonely. Someone else did that. I was in New York and she was in LA. The boots she wore with 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 uh, on Rosie were the same boots she wore on TRL and on BET. They were like there was this boot designer back then who was making these pointy boots in like different leathers and those are the things that we um we were using the boots for, but no, the boots for I Get Lonely were more dance boots. Janet doesn't like to dance in heels, so all that stuff is new lately that she's putting on a higher boot. I don't like her in these big clumpy shoes she's wearing lately, even though it's in style. I don't think it's a good look for her. But the one thing about Janet is she doesn't want my opinion on fashion unless she asks for it. So the one respectful thing we do in our friendship is I don't give her my advice unless she asks. But I do give her compliments when it's beautiful. I thought when she was in that sheer shirt with that suit jacket at the Christian Suriano show, oh, I thought yeah. for the first minute she was Janet again. Didn't that get exciting? It's the Janet I remember, you know? And she also did a look at the Tom Brown show. I love that look. And then she did the Alexander McQueen. The Tom Brown show I, I found difficult because I felt like the belt was collapsing on her waist. If I had done that belt, I would have put boning in it. And it would have stayed stiff because it needed a waist separation. And also, she doesn't need seven layers. She could have done that with one layer and the great pants and the shoes. But it's almost like they put too many trends on. The shoe with the blocks, the bag too big because it makes your body look skinnier. The coat, the shirt, the bop, the bangs. Chill, girls. Let's, like, slow down. Well, she doesn't love Siriano. It's business. So, you know, I think that's great. Um... But, you know, putting the pieces together and who's ever helping her now get this get into this fashion crowd, that's great. I didn't appreciate the McQueen show. You know why? Because after the Super Bowl, Janet, Jack, Janet uh, McQueen had a publicist at Kibo Cavaco and Duca, and it was made and part of the Super Bowl outfit had a piece of Alexander McQueen on it, and it was a custom piece from the museum. We weren't supposed to cut it up, and we cut it up anyway. Well, when the Super Bowl happened, Kerry Yeomans from Cable Cavaco and Duca said, you and Janet are banned for life from Alexander McQueen. We hate you. We don't ever want to work with you again. Fuck you, Wayne Lucas. Don't ever call us again. And I thought, oh my God, like, Janet's iconic. She was wearing McQueen jackets before anybody was wearing McQueen jackets way back in MTV TRL. And I said, Carrie, and Carrie was a friend of my best friend. And no one seems to know this story. But I said, Carrie, that's not going to happen, Janet. He goes, you're out. You're both out. So I'm like banned from the showroom for life. So Alexander McQueen dies. And his official bio goes up in the New York Post. You know what it said? Alexander McQueen responsible for creating and designing and styling the 2004 wardrobe malfunction. In his official bio, they gave him credit. They lied for my outfit. They lied for my outfit. After saying that we sucked. And then two years later, I see Janet's at his tribute wearing McQueen. And I said, Janet, do you not know what they did to us? She didn't. But then when I saw her at the show, I just wrote her and I said, Janet, I said, I, I can't support this. I said, because they were so rotten to us. But I guess it's business. You know, it's business for her. But for me, I buy McQueen, but I won't go to the show and borrow it. And I don't give them any um, any props. You know, they, to, they try to keep him alive now that he's dead. And that's charming. But the time with, with, with uh, McQueen when he was alive was beyond amazing. And that's when I met... Um, Philip Tracy, the hat designer, and Isabella Blow, and really the people that really, you know, Stella Tennant, who committed suicide, the model, that whole crowd in London was was just a wonderful crowd to be with. So these people can hang on, but it's not the same. You know what I mean? And like someone just said, they love Christian Siriano. You want my opinion as a fashion person? I love what Christian has done for his business. He's the only one that came through. The stuff doesn't always fit. Call me out on it, Christian. Whoopi Goldberg and Christian Siriano, the, the, the shoulders were falling off. The pants look too fat. You can be creative, but you got to snatch these women because you're not. I don't want the clothes wearing the women. I want the women wearing the clothes. 
So that's my feeling. I mean, I and spread the love, you know, and, and you, you're allowed to have an opinion and not have fans get mad and people scream. I mean, I've had so many threats from Janet fans the last couple of years during the Super Bowl. You'd be shocked the calls I got and the death threats threatening my family. So I just sit back and I think you got to get a life. You got to get a little busier you know, and stop being mean to people because we all love her the same, you know. Someone is asking about Janet's dressing. Yeah, Janet, when she was married, she converted to be a... I heard she was a Muslim at that point, and you had to um, cover your body. And I respect her for that. And I, she doesn't cover her body anymore. She's starting to uncover her body, if you've noticed, those breasts showing again. So, you know, Janet has a child, too, and her husband, her ex-husband, has things to say about how that child is raised. So, Janet is not making her own decisions necessarily about how she shows up. She's got to be respectful. It's, a, it's not a pop star moment where you can get naked on a stage and simulate, you know, uh, lesbian sex. This is a mom, and you already got all that from her. You got the fun. You got the girls making out in that all-night-don't-stop video. We've done it all. And none of the things you guys are watching these girls do is new. We've done it already. Everything's been done, you know, so hello. Aaron says you should be a judge on Project Runway. Would you do the show? I would do it in a second. I don't think it's on the air anymore. Um, but I would have done it in a second. But, you know, they never come to people like me. They always go to all these people that I've never seen before. You know, and I can't believe, you know, Harvey Weinstein produced it and then he got taken in for sexual assault and Georgina Chapman was a model on it. So it kind of amazes me that, you know, people get away with all this stuff. But the public is so weird. Like I did what not to wear and then Clinton Kelly got my job. But then they put Clinton Kelly or Carson Kressley on these shows and America can, it seems like America can only handle one gay guy at a time on TV and then they give him all the jobs. I'm never going to be this flamboyant queen on TV. That's not a put down. It's just the truth. But it seems like America can handle someone that goes, a girl, a girl, change your haircut, girl. I don't like your pants, girl. I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to be this guy from New Jersey, you know, born again Christian growing up trying to find my way and uh, trying to make women love themselves as they are, even if they're Tyra. And Aaron says he would watch it if you would do Project Runway. And Raymond wants to know, are you friends with the styling team of MJ, such like Michael Bush or others? MJ, Mary J. Blige, you mean? Or Michael Jackson? I, Michael Jackson, I'm assuming. No, I talk to his choreographers. We're friendly, um, but I don't talk to his styling team. I mean, since he's passed away, you know, Janet Satoon did his hair for years and, his, and the makeup. The other woman that did his makeup. I'm not, um, we're not, I was not really in Michael's orbit other than I met him with Janet. And uh, I was the one that called Janet when Michael died. Uh, it was on TV, and my partner was watching TV with me, and it says Michael Jackson is being taken to the hospital, pronounced dead. And I called Janet's, I told, was told that Janet was at Janet's Tune salon. So I called Janet's Tune immediately, and I said, Michael's dead. And she said, what? I said, is Janet there? She goes, I'm not saying. I said, Michael's dead. She goes, I got to hang up. I got to call you back. And she hung up. So I don't know if Janet's Tune immediately told her or called Terry, but I'll never forget that day. It was a horrible day for all of us. Really mm -hmm. shocking, actually. I remember totally it flashing on the news screen. It, it, it was devastating. Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. I was home live watching. But, you know, this is a business of pe losing and winning and people coming and going and, you know, finding a way. And some of us stay and some of us don't. And, you know, I, I think Raymond, was Raymond Starcheck a big model years ago? I don't remember. I know that name. If that's the handsome Raymond. Jay Evans said, oh, wow. Yes. Listen, it's been a, when you work with celebrities and with no Tino shade and no ego, it's, it's, you're involved in the huge shit and you're involved in the dramas and the, and the marriages and the weddings and you learn to keep your mouth shut. So all the fans are like, oh, he talks too much about the Super Bowl. I don't. People ask me questions and I talk. I don't look for the interviews. I don't ask for the jobs. And Janet knows what I talk about. She tells me what she wants me to say and not say. So I respect her. She's, she's going to always be my friend. And this is uh, almost, I saw a picture of her celebrating her 25 or 28 years with Terry and I thought so yeah and I thought I was yeah and I thought I was there five years before Terry her assistant so god I've been there a long time you know I was there with Renee who was an amazing Svengali showing her really how to get her body in shape and he was really tough for her but boy did she look good you know did did we have a good run together you know 
Yes, and everything tied and immaculate through almost every pinnacle of her career has been immaculate. Yeah, you can't, when you, I said this in her documentary this year, if you want to work with Janet, you can't fail. You better be on your game. I mean it. At that level, at that level, you cannot fail. You cannot have a million dollar video and bring the wrong tampon. You can't bring the wrong shoe. You can't bring the wrong belt. It has to always be genius. And if I was dressing her now for these fashion shows, I would have her so snatched that she couldn't walk. But in those photos, she'd look like snatched. And the thing with Janet, Janet may say to her stylist, I don't feel comfortable. Loosen this belt. And I'd be like this. You tighten that belt up right now, bitch, and you're making you walk. You get out there and walk. You be, what do they say? First time at a drag ball, bitch. Hello. Yeah. And she would laugh and she would tell me to shut up and, you know, whatever. Oh, my goodness. Executive realness, first time at a drag ball. Hello. Hello, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny two days before she did the Tom, three days before she did the tom brown show i wrote her and i said have you seen tom brown and she didn't answer and i said janet um i think that he would be great you know the part of her videos where she does escapade and they all come out in costume in her shows i said yeah. that would be genius he did these giant characters for that and she goes oh i, I know him and then two day three days later she's wearing him and i'm like oh shit bitch Girl knew some, but that's Janet. She doesn't tell you everything and she doesn't want you to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we have any other questions, Fashion Dolls? Jay Evans says he is loving the interview. You are being real. I love it. And Carrie Jackson says, thanks for the Renee love. Yeah, Renee, I'll tell you, I'll say, and I, I'll say it, and Janet doesn't mind if I say it. Whatever their issues were, were their issues, but I want to tell you something. Renee is an unfound, undiscovered talent. And he, he knows what works. He knows how the body works. He knows how the makeup, hair, styling works. He watched her like a hawk. He kept her in amazing shape. And at the same time, he kept me in shape. I couldn't fuck up. Kevin couldn't fuck up. Like, he took care of her. And whatever bad happened privately, which I won't get into, it's not my place, that's between them. But what I do for what I do for um, Renee, for Janet is I didn't work with Renee all those years because she asked us, you know, I'd like you to make a choice of what you want to do as they were going through their divorce. And I chose Janet. And, you know, I always feel like I never want to be shady to the partners when they leave. But that's what happens in this world. When one leaves, you've got to cho choose. And I was working with her at that point. So he's an amazing talent, you know, and if it wasn't for Renee, I probably wouldn't have been there so much in the beginning. And then I last sit. So thank you, Renee. Jayden says he's sliding into Wayne's DM. I already followed him. And Kara Jackson said there is no hate. No, there's no hate. We can be shady. We can joke. We can say funny things about Tyra. But there's no hate. There's no hate. It's it's uh, you know, what makes me think my grass is greener than somebody else's? What makes me think that I'm better than anybody out there? I am just a kid from New Jersey that grew up gay, that was beat up by the love of God with born again parents and had to find my way. And I found a God for myself that I love. I found that God is the source of all my breathing and all my success. And if I can share love through the screen with other people, I hope it's God's love coming through. And I'm not saying it in a flaky, like celebrity way. It's what I call it. If it comes through my eyes and, you, and it touches you, it's God touching you. And you're, if you've come to this video chat, there's a reason why you're here. To hear something you have to hear, to learn something, to share something with me, to tell me how to be better. You know, I keep my brain open. Or just to look at Style by Stevie's nose highlighter. Hello. <laughs> the light just changed, bitch. Hello. Um, hair by David wants to know who came up with the iconic red hair for the velvet rope era. That was Janet. That was Janet before me. I when I came in, she had the red. Oh no, you're right. Design of a Decade was after, right? Yeah, she had the red hair when I met her. She was wearing those pom-poms and the balls and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, when I met her, she had the Design of a Decade hair. When I met her, when I met her, she had the hair that she wore in the Pervert 2 t-shirt. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know. I don't know who made her do that red hair, but I, I loved it. I did that shot there. 
with the crochet top. I did that one in London. And then that other shot you just had with the crochet black top, that was shot, oh, by, yeah. Al that was shot by Albert Watson. This yeah, Albert Watson shot that in the studio. And Kevin, Aqu that's the same day. You know the picture on the cover of Vibe where she has the pierced nipple? Yes. Fans don't understand. We shoot all those things on the same day. That was shot the same day we shot that. And Kevin Aquan hated me at that point. He was mad at me. And my mom and dad came to visit on the set and he treated them like garbage. It was terrible. But uh, he used to go up and down. But um, that's the same day that Janet played me and Kevin together again. She had recorded together again and wanted to get her opinion on people that had died of AIDS. So that was, a, that was an interesting time. Raymond Starcheck says the tour book was epic. Um, that bull 301 wants to know, are Janet and Tina the only pop stars that you've worked with? No, I work with everybody. I mean, not that I know ego, but it's like everybody. I mean, remember La Trim, the cars that go boom? Remember that song? We like the cars, the cars that go. I did that. Yeah, that was great. That's really pierced through her nipple. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you see the bottom of that picture, you can see her Mickey and Minnie having sex on her inner thigh. Yes. <laughs> that was the vibe cover. Hello. Um, I did, I've done a lot of pop stars. I did Justin Timberlake's two world tours. I did his world tour right before the Super Bowl. Nobody knows that. And um, God, I, I don't, I, I, I mean, you name it, and I've kind of touched them when it came to all that. And then I did a lot of big celebrities with actors and actresses. Is it La Tigre or was it La Trim? We like the cars, the cars that go boom. La Tigre was one of the singers. I'm so and so and so and so and da 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 da. I'm just reading the question. Um, yeah, so I've done a lot of people, and I've uh, I've done a lot of actresses. I've done a lot of supermodels. So I started with supermodels, and then it went to the next level. So it's been an interesting ride, you know. And I'm I'm grateful and I'm thankful, and I hope that these iconic things, you know, they forget the stylist. So. I just look back at my career sometimes and I just smile because I even forget the days that I was at places. I used to do Levi's. I worked in Sweden for a long time. I did all the big, I did the people that owned ABBA. I Brie um, Ladine's husband, Tomas Ladine, and they owned ABBA. So I worked with those people in Sweden. I spent years in Sweden, living in Sweden. So it's been a, an interesting, uh, an interesting ride. Yes, you've had such a prolific career in the fashion industry, and these looks stand the test of time because a lot of them are starting to come back. The Y2K era, the 90s inspo era, all of that is coming back so much more in fashion. I can't see. believe when I see this stuff coming back. I just watched Megan Trainer today on uh, the Today Show. It was such an embarrassment. She looked like she was trying to be Ariana Grande. She had two ponytails sticking out of her head, just like this. She had a hot pink dress on that didn't fit with like a mesh thing over it. Her dancers were dressed in parachute pants from the 80s in hot pink. And I thought, this girl has no idea that this stylist thinks that this is a hot new look. We threw that look out in the garbage seven times. <laughs> I threw that shit away seven times, girl. What the heck are you putting on your body? You know? So I, I laugh sometimes, you know, and I would help anybody. Like I told you, I'm dying to do Lizzo. I would love to hit up Missy Elliott. But, you know, unless they find me and call, I'm not doing it. You know, so if they call, I'll be happy to do it. You know? It could happen. It's definitely going to happen. I'm okay if it does. And if it does, I'll help them. You know, that's what I do. Oh, they're talking about your the Britney Spears tour looks. Um, Bobo was telling them about it. I didn't do I didn't do Britney. Um, Curtin Bar did Britney, and they worked with Andy at Body Worship. Andy at Body Worship did. So, um, the what's it going to be outfit? Andy worked with Madonna. So Curtin Bar did all of Britney stuff. They're quiet now. They're doing movies. They just they did the Hunger Games. So they're very talented oh, yeah. boys. They're a couple and they style everybody. So, you know, they that we were all there was only about four of us during those years that were the top stylists: Lori Goldstein, me, Curtin Bar, uh, for Britney. And I'm trying to think who else owned Patty. No, Patty wasn't really working that much now then, but she's working more now. But we were the ones that everybody was hiring for all those jobs. You know, Lori Goldstein was doing Madonna. Oh, and Ariane Phillips started out with Courtney Love, and then Madonna stole her from Courtney Love. Hello. 
Yeah, Bobo, I did the black half jacket, and it was so funny. I try to make clothes that the kids want to wear, and that, that, that year, Gay Pride, all the gay boys were marching down the street in New York wearing a half motorcycle jacket, cut in half like Janet's All For You jacket, which was really fun to see, you know. That was originally designed by Gautier, Jean-Paul Gautier. Yeah, Jean-Paul Gautier. Madonna's blonde ambition, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did all the costumes for her tour, and then with Janet, I found that half jacket, but Gautier decided he didn't want to work with anybody else anymore but Madonna, and I said to Lisa Lawrence, who's my friend, I said, Janet's been wearing Gautier since the Arsenio Hall show. And she said, Wayne, I, I can't help you. He doesn't want to give clothes. I said, I just want this jacket. She goes, you can take the jacket and make your own. So I took the jacket that he designed and I redesigned it for Janet. And that became the iconic half jacket look. See, I give credit where credit is due. Why doesn't Donatella Versace? So that's my story for the day. Did you like it? Yes. And a lot of people... Ariana Phillips is still working for Madonna. Ariana That's Phillips really is still working with Madonna, and she does some of the most exquisite, amazing movie work ever. I knew her when she was a little chunky girl in the East Village. My friend Sue was dating her best friend, and I met this girl who wanted to be a stylist that was working in films, and now she's one of the biggest stylists in the world. It's amazing. Award-winning stylist and kind as all get out. Hi, yeah. Skirts, Skirts, World. We miss you, Ian. Welcome, if you're just coming in. We're almost at the closing of this interview. Do we have any more questions for Wayne? Well, you guys have been asking questions as we progress. I love you. Yes. Welcome, if you're just coming in. Welcome. They should hire you for Dancing with the Stars. Well, my friend Eric, you know, Eric Archibald, who worked with June Ambrose for, I miss oh. you too, Ian. Eric Archibald, who worked with Julia, uh, Julie, what's her name? I just said it, didn't I? June Ambrose. June Ambrose. Hello. Eric Archibald is doing Tyra. And I just was shady. I was on the phone. I should show you my phone. It's not here. I said, Eric, get her out of that outfit. I'm watching the show and I'm typing it. He blocked me. <laughs> but I can't. Some of the stuff she's wearing, I can't. And I know it's not Eric because he's an extremely talented person. Did I work with Janet Six and Sin? Yes, once. But I mean, I'm... I was at the tail end of um, Janice Dickinson's career when she was still supermodeling. But I have a lot of stories about her from Christy Brinkley. Uh-oh. Hello. I'll save those. Yes, because people are waiting on your, your book, your novel, as you talk about so many things and spit so, many, so much knowledge here. We'll, we'll, we'll get it out there. It's, you know, if people want to want to read it, I'm going to write it and I'm going to talk about it and I'll be funny and I'll tell the truth. You know, it's, uh, it's, um, it's been a long haul and, um, a good one. And, you know, I'm going to keep doing the best I can do with the design I'm doing. I'm working on NFTs. I'm selling vintage, you know, costumes from the tours as NFTs. I'm working with a lot of groups, you know, uh, outlaw, uh, I told you, outlawnftauction.com, I'm working with them. So there's a lot of things I'm doing, and I, I don't know what's going to be next. I'm doing a shoot with Kara on Monday with some very sexy woman, and uh, Kara's son, Nick, is going to be taking the pictures. I'm going to be on the cover of, I think it's called The Best Ever You magazine. They want me to be on the cover. What am I going to do? So I said, we'll go to a farm, we'll shoot with the horses, and I'll take pictures there. But, you know, it's it's whatever fits in and whatever is great, I'll do. I've got, like, Sarah Arnell, who's a great person in advertising, and Kari Young, and people that have really helped me, helped carry me during the tough times. I'm, I'm finally able to start giving back now that it's getting a little bit easier again after my boyfriend killed himself. So I don't want to keep talking about that, but that does change who you are and how you run your business for a while, you know? So, uh, and there, there will be, there's going to either be a podcast on the book or there's going to be a book published. Um, but I'll tell stories and I'll tell what it's like and I'll tell what it's like to uh, survive, you know, because, um, and thrive, you know, because you can do both everybody out there. And when you, see, the key is this, if you step three seconds back from your life, before you send that text, before you scream, even before you kiss someone, stop and think, is this the right thing to do right now? Give yourself a three-second window between what you say and what you do, and your life is going to shift. Because there will be no mistakes. You may make one or two, but you'll be in charge of them. Does that make sense? Yes. 
And like Stevie, make sure your top doesn't keep showing your nipples. I mean, come on. Well, I'm good. Nothing fell out, so I'm good. <laughs> so that's my story for the day. Um, and anybody, you, there's my Instagram address. I will answer everybody. I don't not answer. Um, my website is waynescottlucas.net. You can find me there, S-C-O-T-L-U-K-A-S, waynescottlucas.net. And um, there's lots of stuff going on, so stay attention to the page. There's going to be more sales and more auctions of NFTs. I'm on Twitter at LucasStyle, L-U-K-A-S-T-Y-L-E. There's a lot of Janet fans, Snob Boss, and a lot of people that are there that I love to talk to. I haven't gotten much hate mail anymore about the Super Bowl, so that's fun. These fans have finally stopped being goofballs. You know, it's like, I want the best for everybody. I want us to all succeed. You know, it's like, come on, guys. And the best person that the fans need to know I want to succeed is Janet, because you never stop loving someone that you love so much. And if you guys saw her boy, oh, my he's God, gone. he's beautiful, life-changing. She's the best mom ever. Best mom ever. We love you, Wayne, and thanks, Miss Stevie. Wayne, you are amazing. Great interview, Miss Stevie, as always. Thank you. I love it. Anything you guys need, I'm here. And um, reach out to me. And Miss Stevie, you've got me now for the rest of your life if you need anything. I'll Thank snatch so them. I'll brush those wigs out. I'll snatch that shit out. I'll turn you around. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of... When you pull off Tina's hair, all she has are these beautiful, thick, gray cornrows. It's so amazing to see Tina without her. Or Tina, because then you really get Tina, you know. In real time. Um, In real time. So I love I love you, and anybody that needs any support, suicide support, I'm here. I'm happy to talk about it. If you don't want to go on, I'll give you um people you can talk to. Uh, believing in you know being gay and you're going to be okay. I don't usually talk to kids under 18 because I want to be respectful of their parents, but yeah. um, you can always reach out to me and talk to me. And uh, I don't have all the answers. I just have the answers for myself and God loves me. Never stop loving me. Never stop loving Stevie for the choices that she makes. You just make our choices. And in making those choices, we help shift the world. So I would say one last thing, and I know you guys don't all know how to do this. It's important that you vote this year. Please get out and vote. Register very fast. You do matter, and we need the help. We need to have abortion rights. We need to have so many things that we need. And um, everybody will be able to make their own choices. You know, let people make their own choices. Don't try to choose for them. So I love you, and uh, I'm glad, and I can feel the magic coming through the screen. And I hope that God's love through me touched you a little bit, even though I'm shady. I don't usually get punished, but I may get kicked in the ass by God this time. Because it's hard. <laughs> um, touch with me and find me. Whatever you guys need, I'm here. Bobo says, and support new talent. Thank you, Bobo, for setting this up. Yes, Don't. get out and vote. You guys are so important. And Amy Toon says, thank you, Wayne. Thank you Amy, so much. We Amy Toon, you guys follow her. She's selling NFTs of her celebrity mem. She's a very talented person, and she's kind, and she has her own podcast, Style by Stevie. You should be on it. Definitely. Amy, let me know. Amy, you should have Stevie on the podcast because you guys are all great. We should all do a big one together. I'm here for it. Definitely. <laughs> I, don't know if those, I don't know if your prayers are going to get to heaven with those nails on, girl. <laughs> I love you. Stay in touch if you need me. And I love you. And guys, anything you need and don't ever give up up you are worth it you are worthy if nobody else loves you i will tell you today i love you i will find a way to let you know that you are loved and you are deeply deeply cared for and you're supposed to be here you have a yeah. birthright you were supposed to be here please stay take care ladies and gentlemen wayne scott lucas and i was like guys i told you 27th with our special guest Donald Fitzgerald. One show next week, and then we'll be completing the lineup for November. I thought I you were going to say Donald Trump. I'm like, I'm watching. Don't tell Cara. Oh. <laughs> I love you. Goodbye. I love you too. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.